All right, we're going to start chapter three, um, nucleic acid structure and function. And this is, this is one of my favorite, favorite topics. Um, I feel like I could spend a year on just this, but we'll, we'll have to limit ourselves. So chapter three is kind of broken down into three different sections. Uh, the first one we talk about structure of DNA and of RNA and kind of all the components and how we have an interdependence of structure and function. And then we'll look at genomics, like DNA as a whole, a well, study of the entire genome. And then we're going to talk about all kinds of different methods that we use um, to manipulate and to analyze the genome. So I just love it. Love it, love it, love it. Okay, so uh, let's start at the basics, structure of DNA and RNA, right? We know that DNA and RNA are polymers that are formed from nucleotides that are linked together through our phosphodiester backbone, and it goes in a linear direction. And if you wanna go back and look at a picture of that, you can go to chapter one, and it's uh, picture 1.10, right? And that shows you the whole thing. But remember, we have our nitrogenous base here, right? We have our ribose, sugar here and remember it, this OH right here on the three prime who on the three prime sugar right can be either um, OH in ribonucleotides or it can be H in deoxy ribonucleotides so deoxy means no oxygen right and then we have our phosphoryl groups right okay so when we look at our nitrogenous bases, right, we have two different groups of nitrogenous bases. We have purines and we have pyrimidines. You have to remember that your purines are composed of two rings. So they call them heterocyclic because they're not the same size, right? So in one of the rings, we have six carbons and in the other ring, um, it's three additional carbons. So when we add them all up, it's a total of, of nine carbons in our, let's see if I could write, nine carbons in our purines, but in our pyrimidines, we have a total of six carbons, okay? So our adenine, guanine, or purines, and our cytosine, thymine, and uracil, which is only in RNA, are pyrimidines. So based on the bases, based on the bases, <laughs> based on the bases and the sugars that are involved, that's how we're going to name our, our our nucleotides, right? So we all know the names of our bases, A, C, T, and G, right? Adenine, guanine, cytosine, um, uracil, and thymine. And um, so when you name it with just the base, you're gonna give just that name. But when we talk about the nucleoside, our nucleoside here, this is our base plus our sugar. So in order to denote what kind of sugar that is, is it deoxy or is it oxy, we just put the DE on the DNA ones, so that you know that. Now we're gonna get even more complex, right? We're gonna do our base, our sugar, and our phosphate group. And um, when, when you say that, then you have to say where that phosphate is attached and how many. So deoxyadenine five prime monophosphate tells you that you're in DNA, you have adenine as your base. On a five prime sugar, you have one phosphate group, right? And so we abbreviate that DAMP, right? So anything that's in DNA has a little D before it. If it is not in DNA, um, we just write AMP, okay? So when we talk about DNA, we start simple. The primary structure, right? This is our unique arrangement of nucleotides in a chain right? So A, T, C, C, G, T, A, right? Um, we depict it as a single letter in a row, and we usually tell you the five prime and the three prime in. That's kind of a, an extra. So you're going to say, right, five prime and three prime, or three prime and five prime, whichever one you're saying. And we know that it doesn't exist in the cell that way. It exists in the cell as two complementary strands. So strands that are annealed or bound to each other and their base pairs are complementary, right? So if you have A in one strand, you have T in the other strand. If you have G in one strand, you have C in the other strand. That's our complementary, and they run in an anti-parallel. So one is five prime to three prime, the other is three prime to five prime. And so they do that, so we have complementary, we have anti-parallel, and then it's kind of twisted 
And so we say that resembles the double helix. So here's our secondary structure of DNA. And when we talk about the secondary structure of DNA, um, it's important to talk about what are called the minor groove and the major groove. They're very important in lots of different protein interactions and how the DNA is replicated and all kinds of different things. So when we talk about the groove, what we're actually talking about, see these arrows here? These arrows are pointing to distance between the phosphodiester backbone. So in a minor groove, right, the distance between the backbone is close, and in the major groove, it's relatively far apart, right? And so the, my, the major groove, because it's so far apart, tends to be places where proteins bind over the minor groove, just because there's more space to fit those proteins, right? And what's really interesting, right, is if you look at the width of DNA, right, it's going to be constant throughout the entire molecule because you're always going to have on one side a purine and on the other side a pyrimidine. Not always the same side, but you'll always have one purine and one pyrimidine. So it gives you that unique, um, consistent width no matter where you look on the DNA, right? And, when you look at an entire stretch of DNA, right, we call that one, we call it by turns, we count it by turns. So if you look at an entire turn, so from wherever you pick any, it's kind of like, oh, it's kind of like um, when you look at amplitude of a wave, right, and you count an entire wavelength, this is kind of like counting an entire wavelength, right? If you look at one strand and you follow that one strand back to its kind of original place, that's one turn. And so one turn of DNA usually contains about 10.5 base pairs. And if you measure the width of that, that's 36 angstroms. And so that width is consistent no matter where you are. But what's kind of interesting is that you can actually have different um, local variations on that turn distance. You can probably hear my son giggling in the background, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. that, that turn distance can vary and it varies because there are variations in the DNA structure. So what you actually see as you measure it is anywhere from 28 to 42 angstroms. So it can, it can vary, but this is kind of the, the standard, right? So that can't be the only structural, structurally important part of DNA, right? Because we have to fit a ton of DNA into teeny, 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 tiny cells. And so if you think about, right, um, if you were to, to look at the length of DNA, like if you laid out DNA from end to end in a bacterial cell, right? The DNA inside of the cell is gonna be um, a thousand times larger than the diameter of a bacterial cell. That's, that's too much DNA to fit, just leaving it as it is. So we're gonna have to coil it up, we're gonna have to fit it. Um, in a eukaryotic cell, right? You're, you're, if you laid out your DNA end to end, you'd be about two meters long. So. Um, you don't have too many cells that are two meters long, FYI. Um, so if you think about it, right, if you think about a bacterial cell, ooh, look, if I get on the white background, it works pretty well, right? What are you going to do to make this a little bit smaller? Well, you're going to kind of twist it. And if you keep twisting, I'm holding one end steady, and I'm twisting, what you're going to see is it's going to curve. And then, I don't know if you can see it, you can see it starts to fold in on itself. And this is, this is more difficult than it looks. It really makes me want to let go, but you can see it curls up in on itself and in on itself again, right? Until you can fit it into a very small area. And that's kind of, whoo, just popped. Um, kind of what happens inside of prokaryotic cells. We have much more complicated arrangement of DNA in eukaryotic cells, but it's the basic concept is the same. We want to fit something small into something big into a really small area. So let's first talk about um, how the DNA base pairs together in order to fit, right? We already know that purine binds to pyrimidine, right? G, C, A, T, cars in the garage and apples in the tree. That's how I remember it. Um, but 
And we said that you can look and you can see differences in the number of hydrogen bonds between the base pairs, right? So C and G have three hydrogen bonds, whereas A and T only have two hydrogen bonds. So what this really cool scientist Chargaff um, found out was that the percent of A inside of your DNA must equal the percent T and percent G must equal to percent C. So that means that A and T must bind together and G and C must bind together. And so Watson and Crick, while they were brilliant, I will say they are brilliant, they took everybody's data and then kind of compiled it into one idea. So um, it wasn't their own data that they based their models on, which is kind of interesting, but science doesn't happen in a vacuum. But you know, you just, should collaborate um, instead of stealing. <laughs> but uh, so, so they call these Watson Crick base pairs. They're not the only base pairs that are found, but they're the most common, right? And so um, when we look at this, it's really important to remember that, that other base pairing configurations do exist. And um, just because we have these hydrogen bonds here doesn't mean that those are the only hydrogen bond bonding configurations that are possible. There are others. Um, but DNA is very satisfied in this conformation. And um, those other hydrogen bonds that are unpaired tend not to react with other bases, but tend to react with like DNA binding proteins, things like that. Um, or other molecules that are kind of associated with the DNA. And that's really, really important because DNA has to be transcribed and it has to be replicated. And so lots of proteins need to interact with DNA. But you can have other standard, um, other than just the standard base pairing, right? So um, what, what contributes to the stability of this double helix? And it's not really the hydrogen bonding between the bases. It's actually base stacking interactions that lead to the stability, right? So when, um, when bases are stacked, the way you're, you're seeing here on the screen, what you see is that there's interaction between um, one base on top of the other. So the G here and the A here. So you have van der Waals distances, right? So when, when molecules are too far apart, they're not really attracted to each other. And when they're too close, they actually repel each other. But if they're in that in-between state, that, that's the optimal state for attraction. And so that's part of the, the, base, the base stacking um, energies that we worry about. And so we call that enthalpic stability. So they're very, very stable like this stacked one on top of the other. And um, an individual, so if you're just looking at like one, that's a really little attractive force. It's very, very low attraction. But if we do this throughout an entire DNA molecule, it's gonna add up, it's additive. The other part of stability inside of base stacking is the hydrophobic effect right? Um, if the bases were kind of pointed outward, right, they would interact with the water. And water would have to arrange in that perfectly neat configuration around all those bases that are just kind of hanging out there. But if we flip them in, and we minimize their contact with water, then water doesn't have to be quite so organized. And so that's energetically favorable. So base stacking has a lot to do with van der Waals and with the hydrophobic effect. Okay, so stability is not really due to hydrogen bonding, right? And the reason, let me, let me explain that. And the reason for that is because if you flip these bases out, right? This is really hard for me to hold my hands like this. If you face them out, then the bases are gonna be able to hydrogen bond with water. So they're gonna fulfill that need. So it can't be hydrogen bonding because you can get hydrogen bonding this way with the water or you can get hydrogen bonding really this way with the bases. So that's not what contributes to overall stability of a DNA strand. So you have to be very careful about that. All right, let's see. 
Okay, so we said there can be other configurations of DNA. And so I'm showing you um, three different configurations. We have the A form, the B form, and the Z form. So depending on what kind of DNA we have and what combination of DNA and RNA, we're gonna get a different um, overall structure of DNA. So our most common DNA, DNA hybrid, so this is DNA, DNA is the B form. And it's a right-handed twist, right? And this is like the Watson and Crick structure. And this is what we see commonly. But sometimes what you'll see is the A form where it's kind of short and squat. So you have more bases per, per turn, well, per distance. It's not really per turn, it's per distance. Right? And so this is tends to be RNA, RNA, and um, DNA RNA hybrids, right? So depending on what's, what's there, the backbone's gonna configure in a slightly different orientation to give you an overall different conformation. Right, um, and then you have the Z form. Uh, the Z form is really long and narrow, and it actually twists in the opposite direction. It actually has a left-handed twist, which is pretty interesting. Um, and so, if you if you look at these, right, our our B DNA is our most common, most stable right-handed helix, right. Um, if you look for the A form, the A form is found in dehydrated samples, and this is initially where it was found. Um, but there are parts of the DNA that can change. So only a small portion of the DNA will change into, let's say, the A form. And it'll depend on the sequence of the DNA. It'll depend on the presence of protein factors on how hydrated it is. All kinds of different things will contribute to the local conformation of DNA. Um, you don't see a whole lot of um, a variation of an entire genome. It's a lot of times just a small portion of the DNA. And it's a natural variation. You're gonna see it in all kinds of different samples, right? Okay, so now, how do we kind of assay DNA, is this single-stranded, is this double-stranded, um, things like that. And so what we do is we look at the denaturation of DNA. And once we denature DNA, we can actually separate the two strands and we can analyze them. We have a lot that we can do, and we'll talk about that in the last section, right? But think about what happens in the cell, in vivo, right? We have this whole big complex system and we have helicases and we have enzymes and all kinds of things that go in and unzip the DNA. But in the lab, we're gonna try and do this as very simply as possible with as few other additions to our test tube as possible. And so what we found is that we can just heat it or we can add an acid or a base and we can melt the DNA. And melt the DNA just means separate the two strands, right? Um, and so if you look, as the temperature increases here, so we're going from 65 to 95 degrees, what we see is we convert from down here being all double-stranded DNA to being up here all single-stranded DNA. And what we look at is we monitor absorbance at 260 nanometers. And at 260 nanometers, this is where DNA in general is going to um, absorb light. But what's really cool is double-stranded DNA, we call it DSDNA, absorbs less light. And the reason it absorbs less light is because of that base stacking. So because the bases are stacked one on top of each other, they don't absorb much light. But when you separate them, when you, when you um, melt them, what you're now going to see is those bases exposed and they can now absorb light. So you see a higher absorbance at single-stranded than of double-stranded, right? And so each strand of DNA has its own unique melting temperature 
or TM. And it depends on, um, it depends on how much is unfolded. It depends on the GC content. It depends on all kinds of different things. Um, but it's the temperature at which half of our DNA molecules have been converted to being double-stranded to being single-stranded. And it's, it's a cool sigmoidal curve there because um, really you're just looking at short strands of DNA. This is not looking at like an entire chromosome or something like that. But when we talk about small, small, short segments of DNA, right, there's no partially folded DNA molecules. Kind of either it's unfolded or it's folded. And when it starts to unfold, there's a cooperative transition. And so when it starts to separate, it, um, it propagates that change. And so it's, uh, it's energetically favorable to go ahead and complete it. And so that's why we have that really rapid change in, um, in absorbance, because we're going from a little bit separated, oh, all the way separated, right? And so it's a very, very rapid, rapid pace. So when we look at this, each of the different bases do absorb light at a slightly different wavelength. And we can use this in our methods that we're going to cover in the third section. But if we generally look at 260, if we generally look at 260, they're all going to have a high absorbance at that point. And so it doesn't really matter um, because we're not trying to identify which nucleotide is there. We're only trying to say, is it double-stranded or is it single-stranded, right? Okay, and the other thing I wanted to talk about before, before I kind of move on is when we talk about this transition from double-stranded to single-stranded, right? We said that it matters if you have a lot of GC or a lot of AT, right? And so what you'll see if this is our standard curve and we have maybe 40% GC, 40%, this is our GC content. What we're gonna see is as we increase that content, we're gonna see the same sigmoidal curve because we have that same cooperation going on, but what's gonna happen is it's going to have a higher TM. So if this is our TM, right? We bring it down here, um, maybe this is, 60 degrees, maybe this is 65, right? And if we keep going higher in our percent, 40 to 50 to 60, that TM is just gonna keep going up. And that's because of our base stacking and our hydrophobic effect, right? Not because of our um, hydrogen bonding. So don't, don't forget about that, right? Okay. Um, there are other things that affect the melting temperature. There's GC content. Um, there's the length of the DNA. So the longer the DNA is, the higher the melting temperature is, right? Um, there's also the presence of charged ions. This is a really cool one. We know that the backbone of DNA is negatively charged, right? All those phosphate groups are negatively charged. Well, if you have a lot of sodium ions, anything positively charged, those positively charged ions will kind of coat the outside of the, the DNA backbone and stabilize it. Because think if you have negative on top of negative on top of negative on top of negative, they're gonna repel each other. So they want to kind of separate. But if we coat those negative charges and positive charges, we basically neutralize the molecule and therefore it becomes more stable. And so as you increase your sodium concentration, you have more stability, so you increase your TM, your melting temperature, okay? All right, uh, I think that's all for that one. Okay, so now we're gonna, we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about more of that protein, that protein, that DNA folding, right? So DNA is super coiled, and the majority of DNA has to be folded on top of itself, on top of itself, on top of itself, on top of itself in order to fit. And so we call a supercoil a place where the double helix crosses itself. So if I have my rubber band here and just pretend that this rubber band is actually two strands of DNA and not one. If I take this rubber band and do this, that's a supercoil. <laughs> 
right? And we see supercoiling in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. You would just have to kind of take my word for it that there are two strands in there. But this is one supercoil. And then if I can, it doesn't really work so well with a rubber band. I kind of have to hold it. But you could get additional supercoiling. So the more I twist that rubber band. So here's kind of a better illustration of that. We can have different kinds of supercoiling. We can have positive supercoils and we can have negative supercoils. And so when we talk about positive and negative, we're talking about kind of the handedness. So if you look at the strand on top, the strand on top here is this gray strand, right? And so that one is pointing to the left. So a left-handed twist is gonna be a positive supercoil. Whereas in this one, right, going left, that's, the, that's not the one, oops, the left one. If I knew my left from my right, that would be great. So my left one's not on top here. On this one, going right is on top. So right is on top. So a right-handed supercoil is also a negative supercoil. And so um, if you think about it, right, if you have this, this piece of DNA and it's got two strands and you go to try to pull the two strands apart, what's going to happen to the rest of this molecule? It's going to actually start to coil up because you're separating it up here. And that's what, exactly what happens when we have transcription, when we have replication, things like that. And so this is what happens. You go from a relaxed piece of DNA to a negatively supercoiled piece of DNA, right? And so when we, when we talk about this, it's important to know that this happens in prokaryotes and it happens in eukaryotes. We know prokaryotes have this simple circular piece of DNA. So I know that that's a prokaryote right there because I'm looking at a circular piece of DNA. But what's interesting is that the things that we talk about happen in eukaryotes as well because if you have a long strand of DNA, so let's say here's my long strand of DNA, right? And it's actually two strands. If I could twist a strand on top of this and I'm not an artist, I'm really not an artist but it's double stranded. You guys just have to trust me on that, right? <laughs> this, is, this is a linear piece of DNA. It's not circular. But what happens is that this DNA ends up being attached to different proteins within the cell. So now we have this portion, I'm gonna highlight this portion right here, of the cell that isn't of the cell, of the DNA, and it's not actually circular but it's attached on two ends and so it behaves like a circular piece of dna so the properties that happen in prokaryotes also happen in eukaryotes because they tend to be attached to something they behave it is a loop but they actually behave like a circular piece of dna all right so when we look at um dna the way that we talk about how twisted it is, is we talk about its linking number. And so over here, um, let's see. Okay, we talk about twisting number and writhe. The twisting number measures the winding of DNA strands around each other. So think about this being the two strands of complementary DNA. And let's just say I have my DNA and it's attached on two ends, right? Okay, and I'm gonna have a blue strand and a red strand. So if I have my blue strand, this is kind of like that wave thing, right? I have my blue strand and I have my red strand. And that's kind of terrible, but it's okay. <laughs> what you'll see is they cross each other a few times, right? Well, what happens if we now have something sort of like this? What can you tell me about how many times the two strands wind around each other? So as we go down this way, we're gonna increase our twist number. We're gonna increase our twist, right? So let's do it again. Let's increase our twist. Let's see if I can do this. I hate that I have to draw on command, okay. 
not very good art. Here we go. See if we can make this beautiful. Uh, that shouldn't be quite so pointy, but that's okay. So what you see is the twist increasing. So our linking number is a combination of the twist and a combination of what's called the rye. So here's the rye. The rye is, um, see this circular piece of DNA here in B, this one right here? This one has a rye of zero. A W, let me see, WR, a rye equal to zero. Okay, and when we do things to it, like we change the twist, what's gonna happen as a result is that we're gonna change the rye. So if we separate this piece of DNA and like right there, we wanna separate the two strands so that we can transcribe a gene that's on the inside, what's gonna happen is we're gonna change um, the rye. And so here's the rye. The rye is how many times they cross over each other. So this has a rye of three. I can't tell what the twist is. Um, you would have to be told how many uh, bases per turn and then how many bases are in the total strand. And I'll show you how to do that. But it's important to, to know that the rye is taking your rubber band, right? And having a rye of zero. And now I have a rye of one. Okay. And so the linking number is always going to be a combination of the twist and the rye. If you increase the twist, you have to decrease the rye. If you decrease the rye, you increase the twist. And so it's a, each unique piece of DNA has its own linking number. And you can change the twist and rye, but the linking number is always going to stay the same. So here's an example. We're pulling, we have this, this circular DNA. I'm going to pick this one little piece see if I can do a different color. <laughs> this one little piece of DNA right there, we're gonna pull them apart. And when we pull them apart, what happens, we go from a rye of zero to a rye of one, two, three, right? And so if you, you, you can, when you pull the two apart, what you're actually doing is decreasing the twist because they're now not overlapping each other as much. And because you decrease the twist, the rye is gonna increase. It's kind, of a, it's kind of a hard concept to see, but um, depending on the rotation of your DNA, how you're, how you're gonna unwind it and things like that, um, will we'll change your rye in a positive way or in a negative way, right? If you twist on the DNA, a rotation of the DNA, you're either going to change the twist, you can decrease the twist, or you can decrease the rye, but you're not going to do both. And so what ends up happening is this linking number is always going to stay the same. It's always going to be a whole number and it's always going to stay the same. Let me, let me show you kind of a mathematical example because Sometimes just looking at the pictures doesn't work for me. So let's say I have DNA and I have a 525 base pair stretch of DNA. And I'm told that I have about 10.5 base pairs per turn, right? Per helical turn. And so if I want to get my linking number, okay, my linking number, I'm going to take my total base pairs, that's 525, and I'm going to divide that by 10.5. So I get a linking number of 50. So if I have a relaxed piece of DNA, if I have a relaxed piece of DNA, my rye is gonna be zero, right? It's not gonna be crossed over. It's gonna look, it's gonna look like this, right? But then that means that my twist has to be 50. On the other hand, if I coil that DNA up, if it's coiled, C-O-I-L-E-D, coiled. If it's coiled, then what's going to happen is my rye will increase, but then my twist has to decrease. But regardless, doesn't matter, for, for either my relaxed or my coiled, my linking number is still going to be 50. Linking number is still going to be 50, right? So just, you just have to know that they're, they're interconnected that way, right? Okay, so now 
we, we know about twist, but DNA is not just DNA. <laughs> DNA is also um, proteins, right? And the nucleosome, I'm holding this, this is my pretend nucleosome. Uh, it's an eraser, it's a flower eraser. I don't know if you can tell that. Um, so the nucleosome is when you have a piece of DNA that is wrapped around a histone protein. So if I take this, if I take this DNA, right, um, I'm gonna wrap it one time around, like I stuck it in there. Let's see if you can see it. Stuck it in there. Then now I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna wrap it around again. And what's gonna have to happen in order for this to work, if I can hold it without, is there, can you see this? Can you see that it did it all on its own? I'm not even holding it. That this increased the rye, right? You can see that it wraps, it wants to fold back up, but can you see that? You're increasing the rye, right? And so you're, you're producing, we call that a supercoil, a negative supercoil, right? And so, um, in order to remove that, we're gonna balance it by adding a positive supercoil to our DNA. And so um, that we can then link many of these, and I can't show you that, but we can link many of these without kinks inside of them, right? And so we can wrap many, many, many different histones all the way down the DNA, right? Okay, so when we look at our histones, our histones are combinations of proteins, right? Um, and I think this is 3.2, uh, or figure 3.2, um, 3.28, there it is down at the bottom. Okay, so we have four core proteins, and that's H2A, H2B, H4, and H3 that the DNA get wrapped around, right? Those are the core proteins. Then you have this extra histone protein that basically sits on the outside and locks the DNA strands to the histone core, right? Um, and so the reason it's really, really important um, is for condensation, right? We want, we want all this DNA to be compact, but we also want to be really easy to undo so that we can get in there, we can replicate, we can transcribe, we can do all those things. So these histones bind to the DNA in a very nonspecific way. Um, it's not that the histones are looking for a particular sequence. Um, they just kind of fit in there and the DNA wants to wrap around them, right? And so, um, what else do I wanna say about that? Oh, and, and so anytime we want to go in and go through transcription or we want to go through replication, um, we're going to use an enzyme called topoisomerase. And topoisomerase um, is something that allows the DNA to change its supercoiling. So if we want to add a positive supercoil, things like that, then we need to use enzymes, right? And so this is our topoisomerases. Topo isom, and there are many different kinds. But in order to remove supercoils, right? I can't remove a supercoil from this rubber band unless I break the rubber band. And so that's actually what topo isomerase will do is it'll create a double strand. Some of them create single strand, but they create a break in the DNA, which then relieves the coils um, so the DNA can become relaxed. And you can do all the different protein associations, right? So our topoisomerases are enzymes that relieve the positive supercoiling through cleavage and reannealing. That's really important because you don't want to leave a break inside your DNA that is asking for trouble. Um, and the whole point of all of these, whether you're talking about type one, type one cleaves only one strand of DNA, type two cleaves two strands. And because the type one is only cleaving one strand, it can only reduce the supercoiled region by one turn. But topoisomerase 2, because it cleaves both of them, can actually reduce the supercoiling by two turns. So if we look, and I don't really like this figure because it's so hard to see, right? But topoisomerase 1, here's your, here's your first strand, and you're only creating a single-stranded break there, right? And so with this single-stranded break, here's the same break, right? We can pull this strand right here, 
we can pull this strand basically through the gap. And once it's pulled through the gap, then this was our original, right? Here's our, here's our blue strand that got pulled through the gap. And then, I think it was this color purple, right? This color purple strand needs to be re-annealed. And so we can, we can um, reduce our supercoiled region by that one turn. But type two topoisomerase, what it's doing, here's one strand, right? And there's a break. And here's our second strand. Why they did these all in gray, I don't know. Here's our second strand, right? And so what happens is we create a double-stranded break. And when we create a double-stranded break, you gotta think that this DNA molecule is really long. And so it's all the way out here, and here's another piece of that same chromosome, right? And so we can pull another portion of the DNA through that break, and then we can re-ligate that DNA. And so it's a whole nother double helix that passes through that break and then it's rejoined. So this is why we can reduce the supercoiling twice as much because we're bringing two strands through instead of only one strand through, right? So our topoisomerase one is basically gonna create a region of negatively supercoiled coil coiled DNA, right? Um, whereas our topoisomerase 2 is actually going to yield a section with no supercoils. C-O-I-L-S coils. Why can't I spell that? I don't know. Right? So, so the whole point of doing this, of topoisomerase activity, is to relieve supercoiling. E-L. Relieve it. <laughs> I relieve supercoiling um, either upstream or downstream of um, replication or transcription, right? Because as you pull two strands apart, what's going to happen is you're going to have that coiling happen behind it. You're going to change the rye, right? Um, and so, so you want to be able to relax that. So the way that um, topoisomerase works in we zoom in, right, is we have here our enzyme, and that enzyme is going to bind the DNA strand. And it's actually going to first, um, here, it's going to bind that DNA strand, and then it's going to break the first strand of DNA, right? And then it's going to bind our second strand of DNA, and then it's going to pull that second strand through the break, and then allow it out. And so each of these different parts inside of the pathway requires different enzymes to help it catalyze and all kinds of things like that. And so what we can do is we can actually inhibit at each of these where it shows that negative sign, right? There are different things that we can target and we can inhibit the activity of a topoisomerase. And that would basically result in double-stranded breaks and this ends up being cell death. And so if you want to kind of target a cell for cell death, you can actually just inhibit the topoisomerase activity, which is kind of cool, depending on, you know, is it cancer or something like that that you want, you want to stop it from growing. All right, so we're gonna change gears a little bit and we're gonna talk about um, DNA and RNA. And so what's really pretty interesting is that back in the, dark ages of, uh, of biology and biochemistry, um, it was proposed that life, um, it's not the back, just, let me see, 